pure religion. I'm going to read something else first, though. As, uh, worshiping there in God, I just was picking my Bible and flipping through it, and this is what came. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps my words of the prophecy of this book. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps my words of this prophecy of this book. Then in the next couple of verses down, he goes again. And behold, I am, quick, I am coming quickly. What does quickly mean? That's right. This is Jesus talking through in Revelations. Revelations 22, 7, and then I'm reading 12 now. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, Jesus is saying, to give to you everyone according to his work. What work? According to the purpose that God has designed you to be in. He says, I, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So stop arguing about who Jesus is. Walk in it and say, okay, he is coming quickly. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the, he is the one that is coming for us. He says he's coming quickly. And this is Jesus talking in the Word of God. He says, I'm coming quickly. Keep the words of this book. Keep the words of this book. I believe that was a prophetic word through Scripture today. And I, I normally don't say those things, like, but I just, it just opened up. He is coming quickly. What are we doing today? You know what we're doing? We're trying to stay away from religion too much. We make religiosity our God. Why? Because we think we're not religious, so we fight against religious, and we make religiosity our God. We're fighting against the wrong thing. We're fighting against church because we think it might be religious. We're fighting against the body of Christ. We're fighting against the good soil that God has created because we think it might be religious. You know what? And I'll explain myself. This is scriptural here. I'm going to explain myself. I want to be religiously following Jesus. By every word, every obedience that he has, I want to be so religious about it that nothing else can stop me. I'll explain myself. We are too busy fighting the wrong fight. We're too busy worried that human nature is going to kick in when God wants to kick in. We don't let God kick in because we think it might be human nature kicking in. We've got to start letting God kick in. In Psalms 92, and I heard this from the minister the other day, I was watching this morning, I think. Psalms 92, 13, it says, God has planted us into the ground. It's in verses before that, it says about the palm tree, how it's strengthened because it's planted deeply into the church. And we, we, we feel that we can't be planted because we think it's religious. And I want to bring uh, understanding that there's a wrong religious and there is a place of purity in what God wants us to do. We need to, pure religion, if you want to put an equal sign on it, it, says be, it means be addicted to Jesus means that you're doing everything you can to do the Word of God because He's coming quickly and you want to serve Him to your fullest capability. When, that's, when we're not rooted, when we are so fearful to get rooted, God can't use you in your purpose because the root is what keeps you strong. It's the strength that keeps you going. It's the strength that brings you to a purpose. So we have to walk out of this place today and you know, I thought I could make fun of it today, I could have fun today, but I'm in a serious mode. I don't, so just take it the way it is. God just called me. I am crying out to God right now and saying, God, what can we do to bring people to the church the way you designed it to be? God, what can we do to fill your church, God? What can we do to fill your foundation that you've created us to live in? What can we do? But as soon as we try doing that, I, what I hear in the world, not just here, I hear it all over wherever I walk. Well, we don't want to be religious. Uh, that's too legalistic, or this is that. We have to bring the understanding between the difference. Because if we don't bring the understanding between the difference, we're always going to fight against religious, and we make it our God. Seriously, we make fighting against religion our God. We serve, not, we serve more fighting against religion than we serve God. Because we're so concerned about being a religion that we're constantly fighting religion, and we forget about being with God.
Now, this is, continues from last week somewhat. It's in the same scriptures. It's right after what we talked about. What, what we talked about last week, we talked about the ingredients of the believer's strength. Hearing and doing the word of God. As soon as you start doing the word of God, people are going to call you religious. As soon as you start doing something for Jesus Christ, they're going to say, well, that's a religious act. They're going to say that. As soon as you start doing anything and becoming a group as a church, they're going to call you religious. The world calls Let Go, Let God man, uh, ministries religious right now. We have a charity number. We have, we have a religious status. Is it evil? No, it's not. We have to understand what is evil and what is not evil. We have to stop claiming, and I know people are going to get mad at me today. I'm here to do a purpose. I'm here to bring you closer to Jesus Christ. I'm here to bring you to a place of the kingdom of God. We want to serve the kingdom of Christ, right? We want to serve the gospel of Christ. We want to, we want to serve the kingdom of God. We want, to, we want to go to the heavenly places, don't we? Well, we've got to stop fighting against the wrong thing. We're, we're fighting against something right now. As believers, we're often fighting against something that's not worth fighting about. Pick your fights. Don't pick the one that don't count. Pick the ones that count. Let's open our eyes today. Are, are you with me today? Yes. This is a very different message, I understand. And seriously, God just gave me the scriptures and I have no idea how it all lays up besides I have the revelation in my heart. That's what I know. At first I thought I could make some jokes about it, you know. Make everybody laugh. Maybe I'm going to make you cry first. Who knows? James 1. 22 to 27. Last week we talked about 22. It says, uh, but be ye doers of the word and not, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers of the only deceiving your, your own selves. And the, the word of God says very straightforward. If you think you're just going to hear God and not do nothing about it, you're deceiving yourself. How many of you are tired of deceiving yourselves? Let's stop that. If we hear God, let's do what God says. If he says so, let's do so. Let's move forward in the presence of God. Well, what if you are a cult? What if you are religious? There is no what if in the name of Jesus Christ, in the authority of Christ Jesus. Stop the what ifs. Start walking. It's your responsibility to follow Jesus. It's not my responsibility for you to follow Jesus. It's your responsibility not to make yourself religious. It's your responsibility to flow forward. Let's really cement that together. Let's be hearers. And verse 23 says, For if any man, for, sorry, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding a natural face in the glass. It's, now I see a lot of this. I'm going to just read the next verse and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. For he beholds himself and he goes away and straight away forgets the matter of who he was. Now I see this very quickly. When people just are hearers of the word, um, and I'm just kind of recapping a little bit of last week, I realized that. But it's okay. It's going to flow together better that way. Um, when people go and they become a self-proclaimed prophet or they become somebody that just hears, they go look in the glass and this is what they see and that's all they believe in. And they move forward and they forget everything they are because you know what? When you only are a hearer of a word and not a doer of the word, you, you get confused. There's destruction happening in your mind. Because you can't make sense of information that, that has a life source to it. With information that's meant to be life, you got to, what you hear has to bring out life. If it doesn't bring out life, it's not the true word no more. It has to bring out life. Jesus is life. How many would say yes? Okay, we're going to really get communication going. If I ask you a question, let's just really get amens and yes for the video, okay? You know why? Because we're having a discussion. Amen. Okay, I'm not, uh, we're, we're, yeah, that's right. And we, we really want to do that. And th I, I got this idea from somebody else. Just don't worry about that. And he was talking away here. He says, this, this, is, this is enough. Like, when I talk to you personally, you answer me back. Why are you not answering me back now? In preaching, you need some communication. We're the body of Christ here. You need to, some agreement. If you don't agree, don't say anything. But if you agree, say amen. Or walk in the fullness of it and say yes. Let's really get excited about Jesus together. Let's really build this church that you can do your part by sitting there and you can stir on the Holy Spirit in this place, the glory in this place, and you can see this move. Don't sit there not involved. Sit there and be involved. Get excited about what, I, what God is saying through the vessel that He has called in this place right at this moment. Right? 
Let's get excited together so I can get more excited. The more amens, the more wild I'll get, okay? Yeah. Or yeses, you know, you know what yes is? So be it. All those things that when, when there is that communication and an expectation of a response, what does that do? As soon as you speak out of your mouth, the enemy hears it and avoids, and it, it strengthens the word I said through Christ Jesus by 10,000 times each person. Now, there you go. We got power going now, right? We got power going now. Do you understand what I mean with the power of agreement? We can say, well, I agreed, but the devil don't hear it. The world don't hear it. You know, this is going to be good if we can do this, because this is going to bring the preachers alive. Amen. <laughs> do you want a live message or a dead message? Alive. That's right. We got to change our culture. We got to work together. <laughs> I don't want to be a one man show. I just want to be the leader of a church that God has called me. I want to be a prophet that God called me to be. I want to be that person that in, uh, intervenes for you. That's what I want to be. I'm not a one man show. The video needs to see everybody being part of this. It's a, it's a church. It's not me sitting in a room by myself, empty, and speaking to a dead wall, right? Okay, I think I got you going now, hey? <laughs> so here we go. He says, if you're here, you go into this glass. Like, I see this all the time, is that we got to stop looking in the mirror because we're sitting there, oh, poor George. He could use a facelift there. Could use that. <laughs> oh, whatever. We are so concerned because we're just hearers, but we don't see the life out of us. We don't see Jesus through us. Because when we look in the mirror and we don't see Jesus, what do we do? We go back disappointed and forgot what we saw. We need to see life come out of us. We need to see the doing out of us. Because once we start doing, we'll start seeing Jesus out of us. And once we start seeing Jesus out of us, we'll start seeing beauty out of us. Our whole body, our own image will change when we let Jesus come out of us. Seriously. He says he's, the, he's Omega, Alpha and Omega. He's at beginning and the end. You cannot argue the point that he is there at the right side of God today for us. There is no other way, guys. He is the one that is coming back for us, and we better start doing something about it. Verse 25. But whosoever looks into the perfect law. What does perfect law mean here? Perfect means this, first of all. First of all, he looks. What does look mean? To look carefully into the perfect law. You look carefully into. You, uh, you look into the place of, you inspect the law. You inspect the word of God. You inspect the law. And what does law mean here? The law means some, everything that's established. Meaning the word of God, the perfect law that is established. So don't think about, oh no, I'm not serving law. Get over it. You are going to serve law today. The perfect law. Christ Jesus is the spiritual law that you need to take a hold of. You're going to start serving it. If we don't start serving the law of Jesus Christ, the fullness of Jesus Christ, and you don't take it as an established word of God, you're going to lose out. That's what law means. It's established. We've got to get our religious thinking out of the way today. Man-made thinking that has interfered with the true, pure religion that God has called us to walk in. I'm going to explain this yet. Don't worry. I'm first going to get you ticked off a little bit and annoyed a little bit. And then I'm going to tell you what I mean by pure religion. But you need to wake up and need to open your ears because this is going to be a word that could change our life, could change church forever. Could change our thinking about church forever. It could think, change our thinking about serving God forever. Let's really look at it. It says, look, it says, we, de, we inspect carefully. We look into it carefully. And we become acquainted with something. We become acquainted with what? The perfect law. How many of you want to become more acquainted with what Jesus has for you? Okay. And then it says, the perfect law, which, what does perfect mean here? It means brought to the end, a finished work. Uh, uh, there's nothing lacking. It's a complete, com- completed word of God. It's a completed law that is created. It's not a man-made law. It's not the Old Testament law. This is Jesus Christ's law. Amen. I want to serve Jesus Christ as a religion. 
You know what religion do? They don't move or waver. They stick with it. You look at any kind of religion that is not Christianity, they do not waver from their religion. I don't want to waver from Christ Jesus. I don't want to waver from the Trinity, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I don't want to waver from that presence that Jesus has called us to be in. Amen. We need to take it more religiously. We can't just take it so lightly no more. We've got to take the focus of Jesus and walk in the focus of it. Yeah. We are too busy serving, not serving religion. We're too busy arguing the point when we need to go and say, Jesus, I want to serve you fully, and I'm not worried because if I serve you fully, I won't have religion in my life. Religiosity. <laughs> what a word, eh? The word that's been used in cultures and all over the world and been misused. But you know what? Nobody has ever misused religion because I'm going to explain what religion means. Religion means this, is what you worship. Who do you worship? Religion is a place of what you worship and what you serve and what you put your life into. So if you put your life into Jesus, what is that going to look like? Yes. And then it says, the, but he whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty. What law? Liberty. Of liberty. Say that together, liberty. liberty. Who likes liberty? Woo! Yeah, yeah. Maybe after I say what it means, you might not say it that much, but it's still a good word. Don't worry about that. This is what it means. He's giving you a, true, a perfect law of liberty. This word liberty means true liberty is this is what it is. Listen carefully. Maybe you need to take a pen and write it down. And if not, you need to open your ears and put it, sink it in deep in your recording system that it won't never leave you. This is what liberty means. True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. That's actually in the Greek text. Do you really want to be free? Well, then start living the way you should. Do you really want freedom in your life? Then we need to start living the way we should, not the way we please. Because when we start living the way we please, it hasn't worked so far, has it? I minister to hundreds of people in my life already, and I know that when they live as they please, that makes a mess. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. This thing just moved on me. <laughs> Get out of my way. I'm trying to preach here. Verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, <laughs> if any man among you seems, which means to be opinionated, to have an opinion of religion, an opinion of what you think is right, opinion of what you think, what you please to do, an opinion, okay? Seem, with the word seem there in Greek means to be in an opinion. It means that you have no opinion. Are you, are you okay if I just give her? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the kingdom of God The kingdom of God is a kingdom. It's not, and I heard this this morning, but I'm just going to do this. Kingdom of God is a kingdom. It's not a politic. You can't fight it. You can't put democracy against it. This is all there is to it. He is a kingdom, and you have no choice but that to serve that kingdom. You have no right to put democracy into kingdom. And what Christianity has done is put democracy in it because that's why we see arguments. That's why we see fight. We've got to stop doing that because we, we don't, there's nobody that's going to take the place of Jesus. He's already been the winner since the beginning. He is the first and the end. So stop putting it as an opinion of democracy where you think that you can control it. You won't be able to control it, so you might as well join it. It is a kingdom of God, and you have no choice because a kingdom runs with the mighty king. And there is no chance of change. And then it says, uh, if any man seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue. What does bridle mean? To lead by a bridle, to guide. If you don't guide your tongue, if you don't bridle it, if you don't hold it in check, or if you don't restrain your tongue. He says, and bridles his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. 
Did Jesus say religious was evil here? No, he said it was vain. His worship is vain. His serving, the place he serves, the, the gods he serves is vain. That's what it's saying. Now let's go look a little deeper into this verse because you need to understand this verse and because I have to understand it more, so I'm going to preach on it a little bit, okay? Sure. Open your hearts to this. If any man among you seem or has an opinion of religiosity and bridles not his tongue, but deceives, guess what that word deceives his own heart means? You cheat it. Stop cheating Jesus. It's like having an affair on something that you shouldn't have an affair on. You're cheating your relationship with Jesus when you don't bridle your tongue and you become religiosity. Well, what does religiosity, when it means bridle your tongue there, what does it do? It speaks man nature, not God nature. It speaks in a place of saying, you are wrong because I can't make sense of it. But they don't bring a God and Holy Spirit nature into it. Just bridle your tongue. If you don't understand it, be quiet and close it and bite it if you have to. Bridle it. Hold your tongue in check because when you confess, you'll release enemies or the Holy Spirit power. One of the two you're going to do. So which one are you going to release today, cursing or blessing? blessing? Everybody willing to release some blessing for this ministry? Yes. We need to start standing up for what we believe. Yes. We need to stop being afraid of it because remember Sunday we got rid of the spirit of intimidation, the spirit of fear. It's done with, right? Amen. We're finished with it. We're going all the way with Christ Jesus and because we have no choice. Why don't we have no choice? Because we have a relationship. And we have a kingdom that we serve, right? We don't have politics that we serve. We don't have uh, more than one team trying to fight for this kingdom. We only have one team, which is the Trinity, the power of the Godhead. We need to start walking in this because it is the kingdom that we are called. Because the Bible says the kingdom of God is at hand. We are in this kingdom right now. So when you're in the kingdom, stop being disobedient in the kingdom. Start walking in the kingdom. Start serving God in the kingdom that has been designed to serve. Did you know God is a uh, triune God, right? There's a three-part God, and it's all one strength. And it's all one power. You can, you can argue that point all you want, but I have enough studies to prove that God is a trinity. There's no way around it, guys. Get it through our heads. Get it, get it with us and just... And guess what part of the Trinity has? The person, Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about say, just saying Spirit is a person, like God was a person? Like it's actually a being, it's not just a substance? Holy Spirit is the being that He sent down, the very Trinity part of Him that He sent down for us to be successful here on earth. Do not forget about the Holy Spirit. Why would Jesus say, if you sin against me, you can be forgiven, but if you sin against the Holy Spirit, you cannot. Why would he say that? Have you ever thought that? You know why? Because he's on the right side of God, and the Holy Spirit is right here on earth, and we can sin against it every day if we choose to. That's the one that has access to us. When Jesus went up to the Father, that's the one that came back so we could do the work of Jesus, so we can fulfill the work of the blood. And bring the power of the blood to many people. Jesus shed that blood. He became a sacrifice. He says, don't cheat yourself no more. Christians, it's time to not cheat on God no more. I don't know. If it's not you guys, don't worry about it. I'm going to preach it out like I'm preaching to everybody in the world right now. Stop cheating. On the relationship with Jesus, with different relationships of different religions. With religiosity, with your own ideas. Stop cheating your God. Start serving your God. Start living in the kingdom of God that is designed for you. We can have this kingdom of God. Then he says, it, it will, don't cheat your heart, don't deceive your heart. This man's religion, which means worship, which just means that the ceremony that he holds is, in, is vain. What does vain mean? Vain is to avoid the force of truth, success, sorry, success, result, useless, of no purpose. Want to hear that again? I don't think you fell asleep during that word. <laughs> Wake up. Because we don't want the wrong religion. We don't want religiosity that is not of God and that's not pure, right? Only reason we don't want it is because it's vain. 
It works, because otherwise it wouldn't be called religion. It's still a worship. It's still a place of service. It's still a place of duty. It's still active. It even has some power behind it. Maybe even some spiritual power that's not of Jesus, but overall has all that to it. But it's vain. So you say, well, this religion is working for that person. Well, yeah, but still vain. Well, they, they got healed there. Yeah, but you still did all that healing just in vain. Because if you don't serve the right religion, you're doing things in vain. What does vain mean? You avoid the force of truth, success, and the result of Christ Jesus. It also means to be useless. That religion becomes useless. You can do all the work you wanted. You can do all the duty. You can do all the worship you want. It becomes that. And so it also becomes of no purpose. You have the wrong purpose in it. See, I think that people, we have come to the point, and we come to the point of fighting religion. Someone saying that I'm not religious, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus. We need to find out why you say you're not a religion. You know why we say that? We argue that point more than any other point in this world right now. In the meantime, well, everyone that argues that point is in religion and religiosity because they're bringing their own opinion across. Anything you do to bring your own opinion across without Christ Jesus in it, you become religious. So we are more religious than we think we are, but we need to bring the purity in what religion means. Religion, in this case, means a true worship and the ceremonies that bring to Jesus. When you study the word church in the Bible, it talks about the Greek word actually means assembly of a religious service. Why a religious service? Because a religious service is a place where you actually worship a God. A Christian service, a religious service. So there's churches that are called churches that are not even Christ Jesus. Would you say so? Yeah. Okay. What are we doing? Let's find the purity. This next verse is the key answer for us here. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, the widows, I can pronounce that word right properly, in their afflictions and to keep and, and preserve and observe The word keep means to preserve and observe themselves unspotted from the world. So pure religion. First of all, what's pure mean, okay? You can't fall asleep here because I know you don't like the word religion. I realize that. It's it's a culture thing, right? Can you just say, I'm religious for Jesus? Let's just go for it. I'm religious for Jesus. Yeah, okay. (laughs) I know that whoever's going to watch it say, whoa, this guy's off the top. Got to listen carefully to the word here, okay? Please listen carefully. Because I am tired, as a pastor, as a minister, fighting against religion that is not meant to be fought against. I'm tired of fighting against churches that are not meant to be fought against. I'm tired of being called, be, having everything we do be called religious. And say, well, I can't do that, it's too religious. Let's wake up right now and find out what pure religion is about. Again, you've got in my way. Verse 27. I wish you would see how important this was right now. My heart's aching to see people follow Jesus so closely that they wouldn't do nothing else but that. My heart is aching to people to see the pureness of what Jesus has called us to do. To follow the word step by step with obedience, with accuracy, with with life force, with the truth coming out of it. He has called us. He's coming quickly. Let's Let's pick our fights carefully. Why pick a fight that don't count? Why pick a fight that doesn't count in this world? If you fight and speak against religiosity constantly, that's what people see you as. But if you bring Jesus into religiosity, that's what they'll see you as. If you bring love into religiosity, that's what they'll see you as. If you bring the power into religiosity, that's what they'll see you as. Why argue against the point when you can bring Jesus into the point? We have to be awake in this because this is the time and season to be pure in Christ Jesus. He is coming quickly. Pure religion dismissed what pure means. Pure means clean, clear. Um, purified by fire. In the likeness, like a, a vine cleanse and by the pruning and being fitted to bear fruit. Pruning. 
We purify ourselves. We, 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 put, uh, we peer ourselves by cutting off the, and burning the branches that are not meant to be around no more. We, we clean ourselves. We start walking clearly before the Lord. You know what else does it mean? And it means to be used, which is not forbidden, and parts no uncleansiness. No your own ideas, no, no evil thoughts. No, it's pure, pure is no uncleansiness in it. It's just walking in the fullness. Did you know, every one of you, that God is not looking for a perfect heart? He's looking for a pure heart. He's looking for somebody that's willing to just clean daily. He's looking for somebody that's willing to cut his branches off as when necessary. He's looking for somebody that when they find out they do something wrong, they're willing to clean it up. See, we're trying to be perfect when he just simply wants us to be pure. Very different. Purity is an action. Perfect is not something that you can, you can get a hold of at this point. It also means free from corrupt desire, from pure sin and guilt. Pure from that. How, how many of us would just love to have that revelation of not to have the corrupt desire in our life? To not feel guilty in our life. This is what pure religion will do for us. Blameless. Innocent in Christ Jesus. How many want to be innocent in Christ Jesus? What does innocent mean? Innocent means that when you make a mistake innocently, he won't hold it against you. Because you're innocent. We are, we're not perfect, so he understands that, and he doesn't expect us to be perfect. He expects us to walk in purity. He expects us to walk in the fullness of it. So now let's go to this religion. So now everything I said, that the clean, pure, um, no uncleansiness of religion in you. How many of you want that pure religion that is so perfected. And so now when I say the word religion in the Bible, you have to look at pure worship, pure preaching, pure receiving. Because it's an act that Christians do or religious people do to get together for worship for the God they serve. That's what religion means. Yes, today's culture, I understand when you say, I don't want to be religion or religiosity. I understand that. But you can start bringing forth and start living Jesus in the purity of the worship to him and to the God and the Father. To bring the purity to him. To bring, to bring saying, God, here I am. And I'm going to make that my life to serve you. What is that going to look like? Religion. People are going to call you religious. But one thing will be different is that you're not religiosity. You don't have to call it after this message. I don't care if you don't call it religion. I just want you to not stop fighting against religiosity when you can fight to live for Jesus. I don't care if you don't call yourself religion. I don't, in this culture, you might not even be able to do that. I understand that. But let's bring the pureness into the understanding that we're fighting against a fight that's not meant to be fought against. We're meant to bring Jesus to this. I'll prove this more to you. You need more proof anyway, eh? Yeah. There we go. So what is it? It's to be pure religion, not just pure religion, but undefiled before God. And no, no defilement means to be undefiled, means not to be unsoiled, means to be planted, not to be unplanted. To have a good soil around you, to keep the soil fresh, to keep it fertilized, to keep it flowing, so that you can grow in depth into the presence of God. So it means to be not, it means free Free from that which is of the nature of a thing, deformed, meaning that this is a place of vigor that, is in, that you walk, and you're, not, you're, you're, you're free from the world, but you are in the place of fullness of God. This is what it is. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit this is where a lot of people hold the scripture against me, and I'm going to try to explain it to you so that you don't ever hold it against me again. People say, well, George, it says the Bible you should go visit the fatherless and the widows. Why are you not visiting them? <laughs> I am visiting a lot of them, but I mean, they, they hold that against me. They say, well, you, it's your job. You should be going out there running after them. This word visit here is, uh, first of all, a very good word, which means 
to look upon, to look after. It means it's talking to, to oversee, to look at, and it's not necessarily going to their house and crying with them. It's to inspect the person that is fatherless, meaning that where can I help them? Where, can they, where, where are they spiritually lost? Where do they need to be connected? Meaning that I need to visit them in the presence of God. I need to visit them because they're fatherless. They need to be, they need to be in the family of God, not me going into their family. We need to bring them to a father, which is Christ Jesus, which is our God. We need to bring them into the presence of the holiness. And so with this word visit also means to examine with your eyes, meaning that you discern, you come walk in there, and you start examining this person that is suffering. And it also means um, in order to see, um, it's to, to take care. First of all, to look after, have care for, and provide for of God. To visit is to provide for of God. So what we do is we try to provide of our own need. But when we visit people, when you come here, I'm visiting you right now. If you come for the altar, I'm going to have a visit. Because I'm going to take care of what's we need to be taken care of in Christ Jesus, and we're going to have that visit with you. Yes, it also means to go visit with hospitals and all that. We all do that. But let's go deeper with that. It's not running after people. A visit is an invitation. It's not a forceful invite or you push into a relationship, a visitation is, a visit, is an invitation to be received. So when I can't, don't run after people, it's because I'm not invited to run after them. And if they invited me to run after them, then they're crazy because that's, my, that's not the race I'm taking. If you want someone, come here and have, let's have a visit. Let's walk into the presence of God. Then what does fatherless mean? Well, fatherless is to, to come as to people without teachers or without guides, without guardians. They're orphans in the spirit realm. They're orphans in the, in the church. They are the fatherless, meaning that the people that are not born again. And you know what widows mean? It means the people that the city's not to be. If you study the word, I can't pronounce that word for me. Whittle? Whittle. It actually prefers to a city that's lost. If you look in the Greek, deep Greek. And we look at this is that we need to go to the fatherless and the cities that are lost and we need to bring them to Jesus. We need to bring the visitation to them of Christ Jesus. Yes, it can, I'm talking spiritually. It can also be naturally. I realize that. And what, what do we do here? We deal with the fathers. We help them with their abuse. They, where they lost their father and their spiritual and their emotions. We deal with that, right? So now we go look in deeper at this. Is that we need to keep and observe, reserve, I mean, reserve and observe these people because what we do is that we bring them in and we protect them. We preserve, reserve and we observe, and we, we, we cover the presence of these two people. Now, you're not pulling no more, so I'm getting a hard time getting it out. Himself unspotted from the world. To... Why do we want to do this? Why do we want to be pure? We want to bring people to Jesus. We want to bring them to the Father that means something to them. We want to bring it to them because if we don't bring it to them, if we don't bring the pure religion to them, they're going to follow the wrong religion. We've got to bring the fullness of Jesus to these people. They're waiting, they're crying out, Abba, Father. They don't know who they're crying out to. They're, they're, waiting, they're trying to find a God to serve. They're, trying to, they're, they're empty in their hearts. They're trying to grab a hold of these people. And we need to get out there and start visiting, meaning that start being a witness out there, start visiting the unsaved, start say, witnessing the, the kids that are having problems, start w- witnessing to these people people that have been hurt, start opening your heart to the fatherless. It means so much. So much to be a fatherless. The biggest thing it means to be fatherless from your God. To not have the father in your life. Because if we don't bring the purity to these people, meaning that they need to find the purity so they can be cleaned, right? So they can get a connection going, so they can have the fullness of it. I'm going to go to the next scripture here. I have all power. Stay awake from me, okay? Maybe you need to talk to me more. James 3, 16 to 18. James 3, 16 to 18. Why do we want to be pure? Why do we want the pureness in ourselves? I hear people reasoning right now. I understand that.
I know when Pascal does this, it just irritates me sometimes, so I know that I might do that for you too. <laughs> but it gets us going, okay, I better listen. At least when she does it, I'm trying to do it like she does. Is it working? <laughs> People are reasoning right now and saying, that's, I'm free from the law. I'm free from that. I'm free from this. I'm free from that. Well, that's exactly what you're serving. You're serving from the argument. Start, stop serving the argument. And follow Jesus completely. Stop serving that, well, uh, this message is not working for me because I'm free from this. No, you didn't hear a thing I said because you were fighting. You were serving the wrong God. Don't serve the argument. Serve the Jesus. I'm not here to argue. I'm here to bring you truth. And if it's, this is for somebody on video, that's fine. But either way, it's not an argument. Don't, don't try to reason things away when we're just bringing the Word of God. Let's get alive in that. Those things you can figure out later. There's nothing to argue about. We're bringing the purity of Christ Jesus, and Jesus says in the Word of God that He's coming quickly, and He says that we need to, he will, we will be judged by the work we did through, that we are called to do by the purpose we are called to do. That's just a fact. But we're not judged by works. We, we are saved by grace and we have no works. It's talking about labor. It's talking about deeds. This is talking about the work of God. This is talking about the purpose that you're designed to live in. I'm going to have a message coming up soon. It's called The Race. <laughs> Possibly. It's really in my heart right now. And this would really line up with that. Maybe I'll even get it done by the next time I preach. But we need to get in the race, and we need to know the race that we have a race in. Did you know if you don't know what race you are in, you're never going to finish your race? If you don't know where your finish line is, good luck. You're lost in the wilderness. If you don't have a compass and you don't have no idea where the end line is, you don't know your purpose and your destiny, you're just spinning wheels. You're just wondering why everything doesn't work, because you have no idea where we're going. We just know Jesus. But if you don't live the purpose, you don't live the destiny, you don't live the pure religion that God has called you to live, the order of the word of God, you're not going to find the end result. Okay, let's go on here. This you've got to listen to. James 3, 16, 8 to 18. For there, where there is, where, for where envy, envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. For where envy, which is jealousy, and strife is, there is confusion and evil work. What does confusion mean? This instability, the state of disorder or disturbance. Did you know when you get jealous or when you have envy that you actually bring disorder in your life? Or when you have strife in your life? Them mixed together, it's, it's a place of confusion. It just goes, Crick. crumble. Well, the confusion, it's, a, it's the state of disorder. I would even go as far as saying the state of depression sometimes, if it's not chemically, if it's not chemical related. Therefore, where envy and strife is, there's confusion with, with every, uh, and every evil work is involved. Where, what happens after confusion happens? Guys, you've got to listen here. What happens after we get confused? The evil has an opportunity to work. How many of you want the opportunity of evil not to work? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get the confusion and jealousy out of our life. Mm-hmm. Let's get strife out of our life. Let's stop fighting against the things that, strive, uh, that stress us out when we need to fight against the things that bring victory. We're fighting around the wrong fights sometimes. Did you know that when you're walking here, that's not your fight out there? Leave it alone. If this is your path here, and you see somebody out there that you think needs help, and if it's off of your path, that's, that's not your, your fight. There's somebody else going to meet that guy in that path to help him. Don't worry. Don't run off of your path to think that you're going to bless somebody because you're going to bring confusion to your life. And then verse 17 says this, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. First. What does first mean? The beginning, right? means number one, the one, pure. <laughs> the wisdom from above, 
First is pure. Number one, pure. Pure in worship, pure in everything that we do. And pure hearted, not deceived heart, a pure heart, okay? The, the wisdom that is above is first pure, then what? Then peace, uh, peaceable, peace, peaceful. I will, we'll say the word peaceful. Did you know that wisdom is all about bringing peace to people? Then it's gentle next after that. And it's good fruits. So first we bring purity into our life. Then we bring peace into our life. Then gentleness comes into life. And then, sorry, I just got, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit. What does entreated mean? It means easy obeying. First of all, this. First one with, oh, this is, got to listen to this. Everybody, wake, 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 wake. You are awake. I just say those things. I don't know why. Um, maybe I'm telling you to wake up in the spirit. Maybe you're not. No way snoozing you on the video, just so you know. <laughs> but here you go. Look at this. But the wisdom is above. It's first pure, peaceable, um, gentle, and easy to be entreated. What does entreated mean? Easy to obey. Easy obeying. You know why it's easy obeying? Because you bring purity into your life. When you bring purity to your life, it's no problem following Jesus. It says it's easy to be entreated. It's easy obeying. It's, it's a, it compliments you. Also, this pureness and this peace compliments you. It's just so easy to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I don't have to worry about every little detail because I get to serve Jesus because there's a purity in my heart to follow Jesus purely. <laughs> then it says, full of mercy and, full, and good food. So full of mercy without Particularly, um, I can't per, no, per, part, particularly, and without heresy. How do you say that? Hypocrisy. <laughs> there you go. You little, get a little bit of my character there. Verse eighteen. And the fruit of righteousness is sown. How is you want? How many of us want really want to get a hold of how to work in righteousness? Yeah. yeah? Serious? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to hear some yeses? Yeah. Okay. The, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So if somebody comes to you and is not peaceful and is trying to be righteous man of God and brings destruction, he's not sowing righteousness. How many of you know that people that are religious don't sometimes become peaceful? How I many you know they come condemning and try to correct you in everything you say? Those words I, I kind of mixed up in, they would try to correct that and say, I said it so wrong that I should just preach it all over again. Right? <laughs> but righteousness comes in peace. You feel the presence of God. And now false religion and religiosity, what would it do? In, in some cultures, it would beat people because they claim Jesus Christ. In some cultures, it would go as far as stoning them. In some cultures, they would do, in the Bible culture, they stoned them because they claimed Jesus was God and, and he was the king of the Jews. So righteousness comes in peace. So when you see people come unpeacefully and trying to destroy things or speaking against things, we have to question where they're coming from or what are they doing. Are they living in righteousness? I want to leave this with you guys. I really think it's time for pure religion to take over. And if you don't like the word religion, just get over it for now. Just kind of go, take it out of, out of your system. If we can fight religion with the trueness of what religion was designed for, where, where the true worship, that's what religion means, the worship and the ceremonies were designed for, to, to worship Jesus, if we can truly replace all religions with Christ Jesus, How big would that be? That would be huge. Am I saying that you're supposed to call yourself religious? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that stop arguing against religiosity when you need to serve Jesus. I'm saying that we need to walk in the fullness of knowing what purity of religion is. Knowing that the biggest thing I have is people have a hard time coming to church because they think it's religion. You're going to come to this church and guess what? It's going to look like religion to some people. People gathering together. 
until the service starts and people start getting filled with the Holy Ghost, they might call it differently. But overall, you have a meeting, you have a church, you have a building, they would call it a religious service, wouldn't they? They're afraid to come there. We sit down like most people do. We don't have circles or nothing right now. We just have straight chairs, everybody looking at me. That's, that's a religious setting. But this is a pure religious setting. Because we want to serve Christ Jesus here, don't we? See, I'm not trying to get religion for you to claim religion, but I'm trying to understand that we can't fight against religion because you'll never come here and be rooted if you think everything is religion. You'll never be rooted anywhere if you're fighting against religion everywhere you go. You'll never find Jesus fighting against religion. You won't. Well, this looks religious. Well, yeah, because it's church. See, the thing is, there's a, such a fine line between religiosity and structure. Such a fine line in order and religiosity. God's order. God's structure. He's called us to, to live in order. Everything he says in the Bible is about following your authorities, being in order, following Christ Jesus. It's all about order, isn't it? It's all about obeying. Wouldn't you say so? So today I'm going to call on you today. Is can you help me think differently and help people think differently about church and say this is not a bad religion this is not religious just because we sit or because we have a church building it's, or just because we have a service on Sunday morning it's not religion necessarily unless if you want to call it pure religion like the Bible does but it's not the world's kind of religion it's a place we gather right now for the sake of true worship before God and the purity of our hearts now, every one of you came in here because you love Jesus, right? See, but let me see some hands. Did you come in here because you love Jesus? Okay. That's what we came here for, okay? We didn't come here because we were religious. We came here because we had a purity of what Jesus has called us to do, and if people are going to call it religion, we can't fight against it. We just got to say, okay, then come join us. <laughs> Let's really pick our fights and maybe pick your own fights. Maybe it's your fight against yourself. Saying, I can't be part of this because it's too religious. 